Hello, this is Jonathan Mast, and welcome to this edition of the Sedgwick Podcast. We have a great topic today talking about electric vehicles in the property arena, and two of our top subject matter experts here to share their knowledge about this topic, and that would be Barry Porter, QC Team Lead with Sedgwick, and Jared Ekman, Quality Assurance Specialist, Nationwide Appraisals with Sedgwick. Uh, thank you both for being with me today. Thanks, Jonathan. Good, Good to be here. here. Well, let's dive right in, talk a little bit about this really fascinating topic as electric vehicles dominate the market more and more or become more prevalent. Uh, certainly some of the things uh, we're seeing is, is what happens in the property area. So uh, we'll start with you, Barry. If, if you can share a little bit more about uh, your electric vehicle background, provide a short history lesson to explain how we got to where we are today in the industry, that'd be great. Gotcha. Thanks for um, for having me on, and uh, I'd love to address those. Uh, you know, actually, uh, we've had the electric vehicles around since the early 1900s, um, so it's it's not a new thing. It's uh, I think it's just um, become a, uh, a a trend, and so uh, I, I know there's a lot of uh, different theories and and uh, philosophies out there of why we're headed in that direction, but regardless. We are headed in that direction, and when that happens, we've got a lot of new vehicles on the market, and uh, we've got to be able to address the uh, the needs when there's repairs. Our team has a lot of different areas where we uh, get some background. We work with several of the major um, electric vehicle manufacturers, such as Tesla and Rivian, develop them developing their claims processes and uh, uh, having access to some of their portals and background information and one of our members has even been you know at the factories and, and done some tours and um, so we really work hard at trying to stay up with it because it's an industry that's always changing that's a great point you are right uh, electric vehicles have been around for for a long time I, I don't think a lot of people realize the history and how long uh, people have been experimenting with that uh, turning it over to you Jared uh, are all EVs or electric vehicles the same I mean open up the hood and one's just like the other or is there differences there are differences you know even there's different types of evs you know you have your plug-in evs that are strictly electric and you plug those in you also have hybrids that you can plug them in and they can recharge with a, a gasoline engine and then you've uh you've got still others but generally the theory is the same they're running off electricity to save on gas and kind of going off the same question uh, from the first one, it is amazing that we had EVs before the Civil War, and at one point there were more electric vehicles than there were internal combustion engines. And kind of what killed that was actually the electric starter uh, that uh, Henry Ford put on the Model Ts. And people had to get out and crank their cars, and that was kind of an inconvenience, and the electric car didn't need that. So you kind of fast forward to today, and there was kind of a – almost a century gap that we didn't really care, didn't have them. And that has kind of come back with the high price of gas and people always wanting to do a little better and find the next best thing. So, you know what, tying into that, there's always going to be new types of EVs. Um, and I'm sure we're just at the cusp of learning uh, what the best way to go is. You know, Toyota's even experimenting with hydrogen cars now which has a big storage issue uh, with those tanks. But, uh, you know, right now we're kind of, as far as them all being the same, yes and no. <laughs> you know, uh, you can have a Chevy pickup and a Ford pickup, and they're the same, but they're really not underneath the hood. So um, the EVs are no different, and we're getting into heavy equipment with the EVs. You know, the big trucks are putting out an effort as well as, you know, Tesla is going to have a long-haul truck, and uh, that'll provide uh, different issues in that arena as well. And like Barry said, it's going to be always changing, morphing. Uh, that makes that makes total sense, and, and certainly probably from year to year, things are going to change in how they look. Uh, going back to you, Barry, and, and while, we're, while we're really here, after a property loss, what do you find to be one of the largest expenses in the repair of an EV uh, when 
somebody's probably thinking about if I'm going to buy one or now I own one. Uh, we're hearing a lot about after a collision, uh, those type of things. What what do we what do we need to think about? What do we need to know? And what's the most expensive thing that happens? I, you know, I think uh, even initially, the thing one of the things that happens is um, uh, many many uh, insurance carriers are charging a thirty percent premium at times on uh, on EVs because of the cost of repair. And so, uh, even before you start, there can be some additional costs. And then uh, when you you typically need to get one of those vehicles uh, repaired at a at a certified shop or that manufacturer because everything is so specific and the knowledge is specific. A uh, number of the uh, number of the EVs uh, today you can't even buy some parts unless you're a certified uh, a, you know, shop through that manufacturer. And so um, there, there's just a lot of things that come into play. Um, along with that, and even with the certified shops, um, there's not a huge volume of those vehicles being repaired yet, and so a lot of the shops really don't have a good handle on what it takes to repair a vehicle not only safely but effectively, uh, effectively and they're not familiar with the process. So they're going to be charging, uh, I hate to say it in some ways, they don't wind up even charging you to experiment on some things or to, to learn the job. And so uh, part of our job in the QC is to see what's reasonable, work with the shops to to um, to get that done. And uh, one of the, one of the clients we work with, um, as we QC their estimates and work with the shop, we've saved uh, just almost 19% on some of the losses. And so um, it really helps to know um, what you're getting in and into and having uh, qualified people work on your vehicle. And and that leads us, uh, you know, to this question, Jared. Uh, walk us through that post-loss experience, uh, how they look at the scope of damage, you know, writing up an estimate. What what should people know about that? Well, it, like Barry was saying, it is we're on a huge learning curve right now, and there's several manufacturers out there that they don't even specifically have parts. They do. They're available. There's just not a huge database. People are not. And, you know, the the shops, like Barry said, are experimenting, and they're having to go straight to the dealer. And, you know, it's almost like the old school days when we had to call, you know, a dealer to get a part and uh, labor. We were kind of at their, at their whimsy. We couldn't – we didn't have a database to go off of. And so sometimes that does slow the process down. And th- there are companies like Tesla that are really uh, – catching up with that and learning what needs to be done and setting a set of guidelines that uh, streamline the process and help everything go through a little quicker. But uh, with that being said, like Barry was saying, um, there are people that don't have access to that information yet, and we're all, we're all still learning. Despite this technology being around for quite a while now, it was kind of a niche thing and not everybody had one and it was every once in a while you'd see an electric car well they're becoming more prevalent and more people have them and more people are getting into accidents with them so it's it's going to be a thing where everybody just needs to learn and there's several of us that you know we've been in the the business for decades and uh, we're still learning as well because there's so many things coming down down the tube, there's so many changes, and technology is is just going to keep booming. So uh, it's it's going to be a learning uh, event at all times, I think, from now on. And with that said, Barry, I and I mean, kind of touched on it a little bit, but let's say you know my my electric vehicle, we I've been in an accident. What things should someone consider before choosing a re- repair facility? Is there a checklist? Uh, two or three things we should all look for. Uh, to make sure we do pick the right place that can do the right work. Sure. I, you know, I think that's one of the things is just to be ready for an accident because it's it's not kind of um, if it will happen, it'll be when, right, as, as much of, as what goes on today. So I, I would be familiar with my owner's manual because uh, a lot of vehicles cannot – cannot even be towed now. They need to be put up on a flatbed instead of towed. And a lot of times you can't jump a, a car like we used to and just hook the battery up to it and, and get it going again. You, you can't do that. And so um, if you do get in an accident, I would certainly uh, attempt to work with the manufacturer and see what they suggest because if they have a certified facility, then 
by by all means that would be the way to go because they have access to the uh, um, uh, processes and to the parts and uh, and uh, to the uh, the knowledge of the manufacturer. I think those are those are key things and and just also understand it's going to take a while. Um, I think in many industries, I think we've seen where where things are not kept in stock. Uh, you know, you've got to order things from certain supply houses, so um, they, they've got to um, sometimes even get the um, the parts uh, directly from the manufacturer, and they're not stored in other areas where they can just come to you quickly. So, the 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 uh, there is a delay a lot of times on on EVs and getting repairs done. And Jared, I I think we heard a little bit, uh, maybe a a number earlier, but what is the average savings after a claim review by our staff that has that experience? How can we help those out there listening, uh, you know, find the, find those savings or make sure we're getting the right uh, right amount being charged? I think the further we get into this, uh, Barry knows the exact numbers, but, um, you know, anytime, anytime you need a shop, I would absolutely re- uh, say to use the manufacturer shop. Um, they're going to be the best ones to do that, and these the EVs are so different now as far as what's under the hood. Um, even I've read that fire departments have to have a different book on every sort of vehicle because when they get in a wreck, they need to cut a cable to kill power to the vehicle so it's not live. And it's almost like you're cutting the wire in a, in a bomb scene in an action movie, you know, do I cut the blue wire or the green wire? They have to know because it really, it really matters. And so once we get further into it, I think things may settle down. But like I said, I think it'll always be a learning curve. There's always going to be a new thing in the next car that blows everybody away and nobody knows what's going on until, again, we learn about it. And I think we're going to start all over with savings, we're going to have to start all over with figuring out what is required and what is not required uh, as time goes on with these. Yeah, and Barry, or, or either Jared or you both on this one, uh, just in in recent memory as, as you've been dealing in this uh, arena, can you share a particularly memorable claim experience and and what did you learn from it uh, that was a value that you know helped you on down the road as these continue to increase? Um, I, I got a quick story. We had a uh, we had a Tesla, and it was it was at a non-certified shop, and the body shop had um, all of the traditional um, repair um, procedures set up in the estimate, but um, but you cannot repair a Tesla the way you would have, uh, say, a Chevy Malibu or a Ford Taurus or um, a, a typical unibody car because of the battery and because of the new structure that's utilized in those vehicles. And if you attempt to do that, you could you could um, critically um, damage the vehicle to where it couldn't be repaired or it could be dangerous. So um, I, I think it's it's not only a huge learning curve for us, I think it's a tremendous learning curve for the technicians in the shops on that side. So, yeah, we, we had to get with that shop and and redo the estimate and help them understand what it was going to take to, to fix it properly. So that that was that was interesting. Yeah, I imagine, like everything else, it's probably a, a shortage, too, of, of trained uh, people that can do the repair and trying to catch up with that curve will be interesting to follow. Well, Absolutely. final quest, final question, and, and certainly want to hear from both of you if you'd like to speak to it, but uh, with the redesign, or yeah, the redesign of the structure to accommodate potentially larger batteries, manufacturers are having to develop new ways to address damage because electric vehicles cannot structurally be repaired in a conventional manner. You don't just go to a typical mechanic shop. So as a matter of fact, that can cause severe damage, long-term damage, so as this continues to grow, how does your staff, how do you both stay up on the changes, and what do you see changing the landscape in the next, even just, I'm sure it's moving fast, so maybe two years, three years? Well, like Barry was touching on earlier, the structure of these cars, if, if you have a structural hit, you can't put that on a frame machine and pull it like you did a traditional vehicle. Now, 
if you pull, you could pull a, a panel on the opposite side of the car apart and ruin the structure and, you know, render the vehicle useless because they're not welded together like they used to be. They're, they're, they're glued, uh, for lack of a better term. So that is that's something you just can't pull and pull a frame rail out or pull a large section of uh, structural impact out the way you could on a traditional vehicle. And I think that technology or that form of manufacturing is probably going to trickle down to every vehicle, uh, even your mm-hmm. internal combustion engines. So mm-hmm. uh, I think that'll be something that could possibly change on every vehicle down the road. And not only that, but as I touched on earlier, we're going to have, you know, the, the larger trucks, your class seven and eight trucks that are completely electric. And, you know, we're, we're not even really seeing those in our, in our quality control yet. We're not even, not even coming across those. We know they're on the road, but you know, there's the Tesla trucks and international has a completely electric truck that they've had to tone down the torque because they have so much torque that, you know, all the freight in the back will slam to the back door when you hit the gas or the pedal, as it were, <laughs> not the gas. <laughs> uh, and so there's going to be huge uh, learning times with those as well when those start trickling into shops. And, you know, the body shops for the vehicles have been doing this a while, but I think the trucks are going to, they're going to be at the, the infant age of that as we were with the cars several years ago. So, I think that's coming down the pike, and it'll be a challenge for everybody. I think you're right, Jared. I think um, uh, there's a whole new venue for the uh, electric vehicles because we're we're seeing um, electric dump trucks, uh, electric front end loaders, the heavy equipment and farm equipment is starting to take on uh, the electric as well. Um, so uh, it's going to be an interesting transition there for sure. Uh, one of our sister companies to Sedgwick is uh, Vale. National and uh, we work with them. They're they're kind of like the Yale of uh, of uh, automotive training, and so um, we've had a course from them, work with them, um, and so we do a number of things to stay up with the technologies and try to keep our our staff trained so that so that we can uh, hopefully help uh, when there's when some things come across our desk like that. Well, I appreciate both of you spending some time with us. I think these are all things that probably a lot of people. They get caught up in uh, whatever it is you buy a new a new vehicle, whether it's combustion or electric, and then you don't think about the long, uh, you know, long term cost. A quick personal story: uh, uh, someone I know bought a, a a very nice European car, and the first time they took it in to get the headlight headlamp cha- change, I think the vendor or the dealer it was I don't know six seven hundred dollars, and they they quickly got rid of that because the maintenance cost. So, you know, as you as you look at owning electric vehicles, uh, certainly a lot of these tips that you guys have shared is very important. So, uh, Barry and Jared, thank you again. Uh, if people want to know more about our services, of course, they can visit, visit us at com and uh, find out more uh, about what we offer. So, uh, we look forward to talking to you both again in the future as things continue to change. Thank you, Jonathan. All right. Thanks, you, Jonathan.